You may want to roll your eyes after the next sentence, but just hear me out. My name is Dave. I am 19 years old, and I know I will never have another relationship or get married. You see, around five years ago, I just went through my first and only breakup. I told my friends I dumped her for a hotter chick, but the truth was, she dumped me for my stepsister, but how was I supposed to tell my friends that? That's about the most embarrassing thing ever. My stepsister, who was a year younger than me, managed to steal my girlfriend. Of course my mother knew about it and was more than supportive to my sister, but she still felt bad for me. She came into my room and put $50 in my hand and asked if I wanted her to drop me off at the mall for a couple of hours. I slowly nodded my head and started to get ready. On the way to the mall, I texted my five friends and told them to join me. My mother tried talking to me while we drove there, but I just sat silently and stared out the window. When we pulled up to the entrance of the mall, I got out of the car and slowly walked in. Before my mom drove off, she yelled, I love you, Dave. I stared her down until she drove away. I was there for two hours by myself. None of my friends texted back, and I was getting ready to call my mother to pick me up when I saw the prettiest girl I have ever seen. I don't know what came over me. When she walked past me, I started to follow her. She looked at me and gave me a smirk, before turning around and planting the most passionate kiss I have ever felt in my life. My arms were flailing for a couple of seconds before the feel of her lips, the light coconut scent of her hair, and the warmth of her embrace made me lose track of everything. My arms matched her embrace, and I was truly happier than I have ever felt in my life. It felt like days flew by before she pulled away from the kiss. She gave me a short laugh before asking, <laughs> If you like that, why not just go ahead and promise to be mine forever? I was a teenager, and my teenage hormones were bouncing all over my body. I didn't care how weird her question was. After taking a deep breath, I asked, how, how do I do that? She grabbed my hands and asked, Just say yes, and I will do whatever needs to be done. Without a second thought, I answered with a quick, Yes, I, I want that. She gave me a smile before her body started to melt. I shrieked and tried to jump back, but my hand was stuck to whatever she had become. Soon, she became a puddle, a puddle of flesh that surrounded me. Slowly, the liquid started to rise from the ground and slither up my leg. I tried to slap it away, but it easily avoided me and continued to crawl up. I tried yelling, but my throat wasn't responding. Instead, I found myself sitting on the bench with my mouth wide open. Whenever I wanted to struggle, my own body fought against my urges and kept me still until the liquid started to pour into my mouth. The taste of copper filled my mouth and I started to gag, but the liquid kept flowing down my throat. After about 10 to 15 seconds, the remaining liquid went into my mouth and I regained control of my body. I called my mother and told her to pick me up before I ran into the restroom and tried to puke whatever was inside out. I threw up my lunch and even part of my breakfast, but the liquid girl stayed inside of me. For the next couple of months, I monitored myself, but nothing seemed to be out of the ordinary. It still annoyed me seeing my sister making out with my ex, but I got over it. For some reason, I was actually a bit happier than I normally was. I was a lot more outgoing, I started to excel in all of my classes, and quickly became one of the more popular kids in my freshman class. Of course, this drew attention to several girls, which I did not mind. I wasn't really interested, but out of nowhere, a girl named Molly caught my eye. She was shorter than average, blonde, and completely perfect to me. We started to spend more and more time together. I asked her out about a month later, and to my delight, she said yes. That was almost the best day of my life. That night, while I was lying on my bed thinking about how hard I fell for Molly, I felt something rise out of my throat. I quickly closed my mouth and tried to swallow it back down, but the taste of copper came up my throat and a small glob of liquid bounced out of my mouth. I jumped out of bed, turned on the lights and looked around the room, 
but I couldn't find anything there. After looking around for a while, I became too tired and fell back asleep. The next morning when I woke up, I got ready and my mother drove me to school. When I got to school, I noticed something was off. Kids were acting normally until they were stopped by a teacher in front of the school. They turned around and started to walk back to the cars they were dropped off in. I ran up to a kid that was in my history class and asked him what was going on. He shrugged and said, They said someone died in our school. I asked him if he knew who it was, but he just shrugged his shoulders again and walked back to his car. Later on, while I was watching the news, Molly's face popped up on screen. I dropped the remote to the floor and continued to stare at the screen and hear about what happened to her. She was found in the middle of my first classroom. She had an envelope in her hand. They were investigating all of the tapes, but all they saw was her stopping in the middle of the class and grabbing at her throat. She fell to the ground and squirmed around for a couple of seconds before her movement stopped entirely. It took me over two years to get over the death of Molly, but for some reason, I felt like I was never truly alone. I tried dating another girl, Grace, about three years ago, but I was never really into the relationship. She really tried to make the relationship work, but something inside of me was pulling me away from her. After several months of seeing her suffer, I wanted to cut it off with her, but when I walked up to her, to break up with her the next day, I froze in my steps. This was the girl that really went through months of torture to make me fall in love with her, and I really did start to love the girl, the love that I hadn't felt since meeting Molly. I walked up to her and grabbed her close to me before planting a kiss on her cheek. I whispered, I love you, into her ear, and for the first time, she truly looked happy. The day flew by. After school, we walked around the school parking lot for hours and talked about everything important and stuff that was completely trivial. I loved every single second of it. When I got home, I immediately started to text her, and we talked until around 1am. Right as I put my phone on the side table and started to drift off, I felt nauseous. I tried with all of my strength to hold it back, but no matter how much I tried, I felt the same taste of copper come out of my mouth. Right as a cup full of goo expelled out of my mouth, I jumped right on the spot. I thought I landed on it, but it was gone. I tried texting Grace to be careful, but I started to feel the liquid come out of my mouth again. I started choking and tried to grab whatever was in my throat with my fingers, but before I put my fingers in my mouth, I felt it rush out of my throat. It was the girl that I saw in the mall. I tried reasoning with her, but she raised her hand and a blur flashed across my face. I woke up the next morning to a bunch of texts on my phone. They were all about Grace. She was dead. She was found in her room. I called her brother, John, on the phone and through sobs, he described how he found her. She was lying on her bed. Her hands were around her neck. Her face was completely blue. Her neck had several gashes. Her blood surrounded her dead body. He swore up and down he saw a pinkish liquid coming out of her mouth. She was the last one I fell in love with. I have tried everything I can to stay out of the way of anyone I felt like I have a chance of falling in love with. Sometimes I wake up in the middle of the night and see the girl I saw at the mall the girl that is now a permanent part of me. No matter how many times I have seen her, I cannot describe what she looks like. All I know is that she is everything I desire in a woman. Like I said, I tried really hard to stay out of the way of love, but just the other day, I met a girl. Her name is Amber. I helped her study for her communications exam. She gave me her number and we are going out to a movie. I hope I don't fall in love. Two days ago, I woke up to the loud noises coming from the house next door. By the time I got up and looked out the window, I saw a moving truck peeling out of my next door neighbor's driveway. 
Normally, for a 15-year-old boy, that doesn't really matter. But for me, it was the worst day of my life. It was my girlfriend's family. Her name was Carrie, and she was the best person I had ever met in my life. The day before was our one-year mark, and she bought me a bright yellow balloon in the shape of a heart. It wasn't much, but it meant the world to me. When they left without even a word, I was filled with a mixture of anger and sadness. I tried calling her 12 times, sent her over 20 messages, and tried messaging her on Facebook several times, but I never got a response from her. By the time it was 11 p.m., I gave up. I put my phone on the charger and just sat on my bed while staring at the house she had just moved out of. I thought of all the times we would just open up our windows and talk to each other. Her mother and father would sometimes walk up behind her and yell at me to stop bugging them at 12 at night, but we would never stop our nightly conversations. That was really the only times we got to talk. She went to a private school while I went to the local public school, so we would just walk around the neighborhood from 6 p.m. to 8 p.m. and talk from our windows for about an hour before we would both go to bed around 11 p.m. As my eyes started to tear up from losing my first love, I saw the curtains from her window move. I sat up instantly and stared at the window. It started off as little movements, but after a couple of minutes, the curtains swung to the right side. I could see her figure standing there. I opened my windows and called out to her, but she took a couple of steps back and vanished into the shadows. I rubbed my eyes and tried to get a better look, but the curtains were back to where they once were and I couldn't look through her window anymore. That night, I could barely sleep. Every time I would start to drift off, I could see the curtains moving and my eyes would snap open. As the sun started to peek out of the clouds, I finally managed to sleep. Yesterday was a Sunday, and I didn't wake up until 1 p.m. When I walked into the kitchen, my mom laughed at how tired I looked and made me a sandwich. I checked my phone while I ate my sandwich and saw that Carrie never messaged me back. I wanted to really believe that I saw her last night, but I knew it was just my mind playing tricks on me. Once I finished my sandwich, I stayed in my room for the rest of the day. I didn't want to do anything. If I walked outside, I knew I would just be reminded of the walks we took. If I even saw her house, I knew that I would just feel depressed once more. I kept my curtains closed for the rest of the day and listened to some music while I read books on my bed. At 5.30, I went downstairs and ate dinner with my mother and father. We were pretty much quiet for the whole meal. My dad tried to say a couple of things, but after a couple of failed attempts to get us talking, he finished his meal and went to his office. I was back in my room by six. I started to read Grapes of Wrath when I heard the sound of whistling coming from outside. I walked over to the window and pulled back the curtains. Carrie was walking around the neighborhood whistling the same little tune she always did. Excitedly, I opened the window and called out to her. She looked up and I fell back onto my bed. When she looked up at me, I could see that half of her face was torn off. The exposed flesh on her face looked to be rotting. I sat on the floor in front of my window and tried to calm myself down. I looked back up and she was gone, but I could still hear her whistling coming from the distance. I tried. I really tried to keep my mind off her, but no matter what I did, I would end up thinking about the rotting face of Carrie. I fell asleep at 11, but woke back up at 3 in the morning. I could hear her calling out to me. I don't know how I could possibly explain, but... It just felt like it was coming from inside of my head. Groggily, I got out of bed and walked to my window. Carrie was standing in front of her window waving out to me. Her face was still in the same shape as when she was walking around, but she was still beautiful to me. She was still perfect. I was just happy to see her smile. I opened my window and waved back at her. The happiness lasted for five seconds. By the time she put her hands on the bottom of her window, her parents walked up behind her and grabbed her. They closed the curtains and I heard her scream as loud as she could. I don't know what came over me. 
It might have just been the exhaustion or the fear that had taken over me the last two days, but I grabbed my cell phone and I called the police. When they answered, I told them about what was happening at the address Carrie used to live at. The world became silent after I hung up the phone. Peace overwhelmed every fiber of my being, and I finally slept peacefully. I woke up to loud sounds again this morning, but I felt a certain level of peace, a peace I never felt in my life. I walked downstairs, and when my mother saw me, she gave me a hug and told me that everything would be alright. I asked her what she meant, but she just told me that whatever happened for the last six months was finally over. I sat in my room while cops walked in and out of the house next door, Carrie's house. My father walked in and told me how proud he was of me for calling the police, how he was proud of me for finally moving on. You see, six months ago, Carrie went missing. She was never found. The cops stopped looking for her, and her mother and father thought it was the perfect time to leave. Carrie was found in the attic. Her body was stuffed in the trunk. The police were looking for her parents now. Tonight, as I stand in front of my window, I can see Carrie, with the beautiful face I fell in love with. We open our doors at the same time. It's time for me to get off here and talk to my first and only love. As you know, Valentine's Day was yesterday. I wouldn't consider myself exactly the best husband, and certainly not with the utmost memory. I'm not exactly forgetful, and I'm good at remembering anniversaries, but sometimes when you work with criminals all day, things slip past you. This Valentine's Day was one of them. Years ago, it would have never even crossed my mind that all day as I sifted through files in the precinct, until I was dispatched for an investigation of a murder at a love hotel, and as me and my partner ruled it off as a Valentine homicide, which sadly are not uncommon at all, that it would hit me that my wife left me a love note in my lunch with more endearment, but for today's special day. As I shackled handcuffs around a pimp, my lovely wife was sitting at home, probably with a slice of my favorite red velvet cake, with her hair and makeup done, waiting for me to come home. I was glad that the killer committed the crime on impulse and recklessly left behind enough evidence for us to bust down his door and arrest him, not too late in the night. I was starting the ignition by eight and cruising down to the promenade to pick up a small gift shortly after. It turns out, I was becoming more lucky by each passing minute. I got a cheap gift, but it wasn't small. I saw a desperate-looking salesman at a vending kiosk full of cheap flowers and heart-shaped boxes. That's when I spotted the huge teddy bear slumped next to him. I parked across the street and made my way over with $30 cash, and within no time, he was throwing pitches my way in an attempt to reel me in and grab my attention, though it was already his. His greasy hair was slicked back against his shiny head, and the goggle-like glasses made his heterochromatic eyes appear ten times larger. If I weren't in a hurry, I might have been a bit apprehensive, but... I was just eager to get home with some attempt of a cheesy and crappy gift to compensate for my lack of effort. I pulled out my wallet and pointed to the bear. I'll take the life-size teddy bear and the hell with it, a dozen of those pink roses. The man shook his head vigorously, his skinny fingers drumming against the surface of the kiosk. I arched a brow. Are you sure? He asked. It's a bit more expensive, and with all due respect, sir... I'm not sure your wife would like such a childish gift. I lied. It's... it's for my daughter. His face lit up. Oh, of course. My apologies. Wouldn't want a sad customer. I rolled my eyes. So, yeah. The roses and the bear. That'll be all, thanks. Keep the change. He handed me my items and thanked me generously, over and over. I turned around, dragging this large bear behind me with a slight struggle before I caught him say something under his breath. I'm sure your daughter would love it. 
turns out my daughter did indeed love the gifts. I admitted to my wife that it was a last resort, but she simply didn't care. She thought it was incredibly cute. Her words, not mine. It wasn't until the following day where she was not as appreciative. The teddy bear was sitting tall and hunched over in the living room, not far from the kitchen where we both were getting ready to head out to work, when it began making a clicking noise. We looked at the bear, confused, before a shutter sound went off and an illuminating flash blinked from its glossy, strange-looking eyes. We both froze in place, our eyes wide. I don't know why, maybe habit, but I rested my hand on the holster of my gun as I silently crept towards it, telling my wife not to move, though it was my best assumption that she was paralyzed from both shock and fear. The closer I got, the more I stared into those curious, different-looking eyes. I saw a lens focus and zoom on my face as I approached it. My heart thudded loudly in my chest as I thought out my options. What would I do? Shoot it if it asked me to say cheese? Shoot a teddy bear right in the stuffing for taking my headshot? I heard the familiar clicking noise, and just as the shutter went off, I hit one of its eyes with the butt of my gun. I hit it again and again and again in both of its eyes. When I deemed it destroyed, I dragged it over to the couch and flipped it on its stomach to investigate the stitching. Get me the scissors, will you? I asked. My wife brought over the scissors, her eyes still wide. I cut the bear open with no hesitation, furiously digging through the stuffing until my fingers curled around a cold, smooth edge. I pulled out the heavy hunk of metal and let it plop on the floor, confirming my suspicions. Fucking creep, I hissed. He'd only sell it to me once he knew it was for a kid. That's fucking sick. Is, is that a... asked my wife. I nodded, glaring at the object as if it would break in a million different pieces if I did. I hope this is the only one he sold. The investigation has since still not been conclusive, and this case was far more extensive than we ever could have imagined or hoped. Turns out, we were dealing with a pedophile. No surprise there. Who we would be arresting on charges of child pornography and harassment, also a nuisance suit for the nanny cams. Though his kiosk had disappeared, he left us plenty of trails. He owned a surveillance department in town, and had installed his own cameras to many of these jumbo teddy bears and we were able to trace the live feed back to his store. We confiscated every tape and every photograph he'd recorded of so many innocent, oblivious people. No, I'm sorry, children. None of them were adults. He only sold for children, except for my case. He didn't just sell to the children of our city, but all over the states. Because of this, it would be impossible for us to warn every owner. We merely destroyed the recording software and made it so that the cameras would be capturing nothing, nothing that could be traced except for by the owners. But we did send out several Amber Alerts to every state we could. Word got around about the teddy bears, and they became less popular this year. Stuffed animals in general were no longer the ideal gift. I've watched what was on those tapes. None of the other cameras, except for the one in the bear I had purchased, had flashed or clicked or revealed any sign that they were anything other than stuffed bears. My wife and I got lucky. We were the mishap. When ours had been assembled, our suspect used a different camera for the first time, as he admitted in interrogation, and he thought he disarmed all of these effects. Luckily for us, and thousands of others this day forward, he hadn't. It was one simple mistake that ended this horrific tirade. It was obvious he did not work alone, but he wouldn't snitch or give us any other information, so we were forced to just arrest him on the current charges and try our best on the investigation from there. The reason I'm sharing this is because I've seen the return of these bears and for a cheap price. I've seen some being sold for just 10 bucks at your local Target, and I'm warning you, look very closely into those eyes of your bear. 
We've since arrested others involved, but I know whoever's behind this grand scheme is still out there. I can't reveal too much, as this case is still open, but what happened with my wife was a fluke. Whoever is still in on this sick fiasco is a lot better at hiding a surveillance camera in a teddy bear. My wife and I have since decided that Valentine's Day is not a day we should even consider in our agenda. It's not even a real holiday. It's just a scheme to get you to spend your money on chocolates and flowers and fancy dinner dates. And sometimes, in a case like this, a salesman will abuse this opportunity for his own selfish needs. I just hope for most, what they want is money and not the latter.